Hello, I'm Pastor Brian from Charlestown Baptist Church. We invite you to come and join us as the church gathers for worship. But until then, we put our sermons on video so that we can be a ministry to you and your family wherever you are. God bless you. As we make our way into the message this morning, we're in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 18. And Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem for the last time. He is heading for the cross. Along his journey toward Jerusalem, he and the disciples encountered a variety of folks in all sorts of circumstances. And along the way, Jesus ministers to them and he speaks with them. Sometimes he heals their illnesses. Sometimes he teaches very often he told some stories, parables, little, little slices of life that in some way illustrate a spiritual truth. In Luke 18, we have four episodes that lead us up to our focal text that we're going to work on. We have the story of a persistent widow. In her humility, in her poverty, she persevered in seeking justice for her cause and eventually, she was blessed by that persistence. We have the story of a Pharisee and a tax collector that went up to the temple. And the Pharisee, in his religious pride, in his intense self-righteousness, bragged to God about how good a fellow he was. But the tax collector humbled himself and confessed his sin, and confessed his need for God, and through his humility, he found grace. We have some little children that were brought to the Lord, and the disciples were uptight about that, and they said, get them kids away from here. The master does not have time for your snotty-nosed childrens. <laughs> it's not quite what they said, but you know what I'm saying. But Jesus said, bring them all, verse 16 and 17, bring them all to me, for of such is the kingdom of God. I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom as a little child shall by no means enter in. And then we have a man who was known as the rich young ruler, the guy that had everything going on in life. Influence, wealth, and he loved those things. And he loved being who he was and hearing that the path to abundant life would mean giving up that much in order to follow the Lord completely. He went away sad because his possessions were great. Four simple stories that illustrate for us that a humble and unassuming spirit is the path to knowing God's grace and that ego and pride will surely lead us to a fall. That brings us to Luke 18, 24 to 27. When the rich young ruler walked away, Jesus turned to his disciples and spoke these words. And I invite you to stand that we would honor the reading of God's word. Luke 18, beginning at verse 24. He said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, who then can be saved? But he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Father God, I pray your blessings upon these words that they would penetrate our hard hearts and we would see your truth and your grace and your love in them. I pray, Lord, that we would have absolute faith and trust and confidence in you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. When Jesus spoke these words to his disciples, they were a little bit dumbfounded. They were astounded because this kind of thought flies in the face of the conventional wisdom of the day. The Hebrew culture had some expectations about what it meant to be blessed 
and honored by God. In the Hebrew mind, especially with the influence of the Sadducees who denied the resurrection and the afterlife, in the Hebrew mind, a bit of wealth, a bit of prosperity and comfort, a few coins in the pocket, a couple of sheep in the pasture, those were the signs of God's favor and God's blessing. In that mindset, in that culture, when God showed his favor upon you, he would do so in tangible and material ways. And along the same lines, for the poor and the penniless, the downtrodden and the outcasts of society, they were obviously under the curse of God, who chose not to bless them, some kind of punishment for some kind of sin. And that was part of the thought process of the culture. And it seems to me that us in our contemporary world, we've not come so far, have we? We, we adopt a lot of that even subconsciously in our consumer culture, our materialistic society. We seem to think if I have a couple of dollars in the bank, then everything is going to be okay. If the government will send me another stimulus check, I'm going to make it through. And if there's poverty, well, if there's poverty, we want to pray for those people because they have so little and we wish that God would bless them somehow or that they would at least get a job. That's our mindset. That's our thinking. <laughs> and then church comes along and those prosperity gospel guys, they open up their fat mouths and tell you that God wants you to have more abundance and if you simply claim your millions, then God is obligated to give it to you and if you're poor, that means you don't have enough faith to be rich and I think to myself, how in the world can that be the word of God? Because what I see in scripture is that Jesus loves the poor people. And Jesus loves the outcasts. And Jesus cares very much for the people that are living on the fringe and have so much less. And he scoffs at the rich. And he ridicules them. And here, verse 24 and 25... It's easier for a big old, smelly, stinky, two-humped, spitty camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich people to find the grace of God. The story of the rich young ruler is found in three of the Gospels. He had the money, he had the influence, he had the good looks and charm, he had a place in society. He had all the things that people have been searching the earth for for all time. In the Hebrew mind, he was living in all the blessings and favor of God. But he knew that those things didn't really satisfy. And here he is coming to Jesus asking, what does it really mean to inherit eternal life? And he and Jesus talked they talked about the commandments, and they talked about the religious activity. And the young man said, yes, I did all those things. What next? I still feel so empty and far from God. Clearly, I'm missing it. What now? And Jesus said in verse 22 and 23, let go of what you have on this earth. Turn your back on all those things that define you, your influence, your fame, and fortune. Give it up. Bless your fellow man, and then come follow me. And the guy said, I, I don't think I want to do that. It's too much to ask. I can't let go of those things I love on the earth so much. And he walked away. It's a heartbreak of a story, isn't it? He was so close. Here in the U.S. of America, I think we all realize that we are abundantly blessed. If you have $100 in your bank account today, you are among the top 20% of the wealthiest people that have ever lived on the earth. 
If your family's combined income is greater than $50,000 per year, you are right now today in the top 2% of the wealthiest people in the world. And there are a billion people on the planet today that live on less than $1 a day. We are blessed. We are very fortunate. So if we take verse 24 at face value, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to find God. If we take that at face value, we might find ourselves in trouble, yes? Leads to the question, is it a sin to have a few things? Is there something, are we doing something wrong simply because we are reasonably wealthy Americans? <clears throat> we need to understand some of the grammar and the intent of the original language. The key is understanding the word that becomes to have from Greek to English. Those who have, <clears throat> those who have riches. And it's more than meaning I have on a purple necktie, okay? It is a have in the sense of to hold, to cling tightly to, to be identified with, closely connected with. What Jesus is saying is if we hold closely to our wealth, if we find our personal value and wealth because of our bank account or because of our influence or because of the things of this world, then is where we are in trouble. Like the rich young ruler got in trouble. Because if we're doing those things, that means we are not finding our value in Christ. Finding our value in Christ is where it's at not in the trappings of the world. What the Lord is saying is this, don't let your possessions possess you. Don't let the things that you own become what owns you. Don't cling so tight to the wealth and the goods and the things because when it comes down to it, it's only stuff and it's all going to fall apart anyway and nobody here is going to buy their way into heaven. But also, and this goes far beyond merely things and possessions. Add in your achievements, add in the esteem of the community, add in the admiration of the world, the accomplishments, the trophies, and the gold medals. And you factor in our attitudes of pride and ego. Then is where we are on dangerously thin ice. Those are what truly sabotage us, the possessions that sink us so quickly. Because if we are finding our value based on what we've done, based on being somebody, if we are finding our security or our peace or our confidence in all the things that we do and all the things that we have, then where have we any room left for God? Where have we any room left for his life and his love and his word? And it truly is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than to find an eternal life with an ego quite so large. Which leads me to the bucket. It leads me to the bucket, and the bucket represents all the things in the world that define me. All the things in the world that add value to my life. And this is a one-gallon bucket, and it only holds so much. And if my bucket is filled with my water, then there's not much room left for the milk and honey of the Lord. There's not much room left for the good things that God wants to give me. And I've got to dump out a good bit of what I have stuffed in here to leave space and room for what God wants to give me. And the more I dump out what is mine, the more space and room there is for the Lord 
to fill me. If my worth is found in my will and my possessions, I got no room for what God wants to bless me with. I must empty myself. In the Apostle Paul's words, it was, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. John the Baptist said, He must increase, I must decrease. And the question comes down to this, do I really and truly trust God to define me? Where did that come from? Do I trust God to provide for me? Do I trust that God has my best interest at heart? Or am I going to stick to what I'm familiar with? I'm going to cling to what I want and what I like and what pleases me. Because I cannot do both at the same time. I can only carry so much in my life. If I can absolutely trust that God is with me, and God fills me, and God is going to be good to me, and all that is sufficient, then I can pour out self. And I can pour out ego, and I can pour out pride, and I can let go of all the things of the earth and simply let the milk and honey of the good Lord be my provision. And in my head, and in my heart, and in my soul, and in my material well-being, in my physical health, and in my relationships, in all of who I am. At the close of this conversation in verse 28... Peter said to the Lord, you know, Jesus, we have left it all behind to follow you. And I suspect that Peter was thinking of his family and his fishing boat and his home. And that makes perfect sense. He left it all. What things are we fondest of on earth? What things define us? Family, home, and a spe- for, I can only speak for the male mind, but in many cases, occupation and careers. Men, when they ask, what do you do? What's the first thing you tell them? Your job. I'm a postman. I'm a banker. I'm a minister. I'm an astronaut, whatever. So much of our sense of identity comes from the things that we do, our occupation, our careers, Peter says, I left it all behind to follow you, Jesus. And in a very real and practical sense, he did. And Jesus acknowledges that. And says that anybody that leaves those things behind, home, family, all those relationships and things that define us, for the sake of the kingdom, will receive so much more. And we are now defined by the kingdom of God. We'll receive many times more in this present time and in the times to come. And I see two promises in that little statement at the end of Jesus' words there. The second promise, the age to come, the things of the future, is so often how we try to define our eternal life, our salvation. Heaven and hell and eternity and all those things. When we ask, what is eternal life? Well, it's the home beyond the skies and being with grandma and grandpa and all those who have gone before us. And that's an important part of our faith. That is a central and defining element of the things that we believe. And there is comfort in knowing that our future is secure when we come to the end of our days on the earth. And it's a blessing to know that all the ones we have loved and have died from our presence, they are in a good place and we will see them again and we say amen to that. And the Bible also gives fair warning about those who reject Jesus, who continue to go their own hard-headed way. Death without end. An eternal lake of fire prepared for Satan and his demons with no hope and no reprieve, and no escape. And that, my friends, is the word of God. By faith, you too can escape that condemnation. And 
And even you can be saved by faith, by trusting in Jesus alone. So that's the one promise. But Jesus also said, many times more in this present time, in the here and now, in the today, in the life we are living on God's green earth. And if we leave those things behind that try to shape and mold and define us, wealth and ego and will and relationships that keep piling on, and rather we choose to be defined by Christ Jesus and his mercy, we will receive many times more here and now. Jesus said in John 10, I've come, that they would have life and have it, how? More abundant. More abundant. David, King David said in Psalm 27, I would, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord where? In the land of the living, here and now and today. My friends, our eternal life is right now. Our eternal life is today. And this is as much a part of it as anything else. And the grace and peace and hope and love that defines us, the power and strength and joy of the Lord that sustains us and makes our lives worth living is ours. If only we would let go of self, if only we would let go of pride, dump it out and give ourselves room and space to receive all that God has in store for us. If only there was room in your bucket. The problem is our buckets are so full of ourselves. The bucket is so full of all the stuff we want and the things we think we need and the worldly goods that we long for and the ego, the ego, and the pride and the sins. There's no more le room left for God. When we let the world own us, when we cling to, when we, we have the things of the world, and they have us, and our bucket's already full. And so God waits a while, and he waits for us to pour, out, pour it out, make some space, humble ourselves, let go of that world's definition, repent of your pride, or your greed, or your sin, for you to decrease a bit, so that the Lord may increase in you. Do you trust God? Do you have absolute trust in God? Do you believe in God that he is with you? Or maybe, maybe you find all of this too much. All this God stuff and all this Jesus talk, and it just doesn't make sense. And we struggle to grasp this message of grace, and we think, how could that be? Verse 27 is for you. If you think this word of God is kind of far-fetched or too good to be true or hard to believe, this is your verse. Because it doesn't always add up in our mind. The things that we think of as impossible not adding up, not making sense. <laughs> That's nothing to God. All things are possible with him. Nothing is out of his reach. Nothing is beyond his grasp. And that includes sinners like you and me. So trust in him, amen? Hope in him. Put your faith in him. Let go of the things of the world. And find yourself in Jesus Christ. Amen. Father God, we thank you and praise you for all that you are. We give you the glory and we humble ourselves before you. That you would do your work in us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. In a few minutes we're going to celebrate the table of the Lord. And I'm going to, we'll get to that part in the due course of time. Between now and then I want to give you an opportunity 
to open up your heart to what God is doing in your life. And the altar will be open for any prayer you have in your mind. I invite you to know Jesus as your Savior. Would you stand with us, please? If you have a burden, you come now. My prayer that this sermon has been a blessing to you and that the Lord spoke to you through these words. We appreciate your participation. If we can be of ministry to you or your family, feel free to give us a call at the church office, 304-725-5917. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, God bless you.